Good morning. Uh, we welcome you as we, the, the body of Christ, have gathered to worship online. You know, as children of God, we have hope in knowing that Jesus is Lord, even in the most difficult times. So this morning, we are going to worship, we're going to celebrate, we're going to praise God's name, and we are going to proclaim his word. So in just a few moments, Pastor Daniel is going to come and continue our series from the book of John called Seven Signs. And this morning, we're going to see Jesus cause just a few fish and loaves of bread uh, to feed over 10,000 people. And in this, show that Jesus not only controls physical properties, but that in multiplying the food, he is the creator. Uh, but before he comes, I ask that you go ahead and pull out your device and uh, go to our, our app, our Canaan STL app, and uh, click on this Sunday, select this Sunday right at the top in the center of the app. Then you will see uh, connect up at the top. If you would select that, uh, then you're going to see a lot of opportunities here. Well, you're going to see places to, a place to put in your information and then um, a place to respond to what God does in the worship today as well as in the proclamation of his word. And then also see some ministries that, that you can be a part of. And one of those that I want to highlight this morning is uh, to check up on and um, to adopt one of our seniors. Uh, many of our senior adults uh, live alone and are not online. And Pastor Ed is putting together a team to adopt a senior. So what you would do, uh, you would just give them a call, have conversation with them, find out if they have any needs, uh, concerns they have. Uh, just talk with them. Uh, pray with them over the phone and just let them know they are loved, uh, they are not forgotten, and that they are not alone. Now to sign up for this, all you need to do is respond here on the app on the, the church app. You can also message us at Facebook or you can email us. Now, currently our website and email are down, so we have established a temporary email uh, for you to communicate with us. And that email is CanaanBaptistSTL at gmail.com. Once again, that is CanaanBaptistSTL at gmail.com. Okay, so now if you would go back, hit the back button, go back to that original screen, um, you will see sermon notes that you can click on and uh, use those during Pastor Daniel's message this morning, as well as you can click on prayer and put in prayer requests and praises. Now, there are just a few other things that we need to let you know about that are coming up. Um, for starters, uh, there are no activities here on campus, at least through April 4th. Uh, we will continue praying and watch and see what happens, and we'll keep you up, updated on things there. Uh, but just note that. And, and please right now s stay um, focused on Facebook, on our Facebook page, where we will have updates on there. And hopefully our website will be up soon. Also, uh, know that our, the pastors here will be sending out emails and videos uh, each week. Uh, Pastor Martin will be sending out his on Thursdays for families, and I will be sending out mine to the student ministry on Tuesdays. And lastly, uh, we want you to know that we are setting up an online platform for our connection groups, okay? And Pastor Mike will be initiating the training for that this week. All right, we're going to... Uh, now get ready just to go into a time of worship, but I just want to lead us in, uh, in prayer and take us before God's throne before we do. So would you pray with me, please? Holy God, uh, we gather in your presence this morning. Uh, we worship your name, for you are God and you are Lord over all things. Father, your word says that um, those that, that seek you, that trust in you, that you bless them and your presence is with them. So we um, cry out to you this morning. Uh, this is a very difficult time. Um, many are struggling, many are hurting, many are concerned of what's gonna happen with, with, our, with the, the future and, and days to come. But God, we know that you are Lord and that you are sovereign and all of this is in your hand. And we have no reason to worry. We have no reason to fret. Uh, we just trust in you and we walk with you. So this morning, God, as we uh, worship your name, as we proclaim your word, we pray that you would receive all glory and praise and that any out there that, that do not know you as Lord, I pray that this um, online transmission 
gets to them, that they hear the truth of who you are and that there's hope in you. And God, may you be glorified in worship this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice.
good morning. We're so happy that you are joining us just to worship this morning, whatever that looks like. Um, it may not be what you typically think of as your Sunday worship, but wow, what an opportunity just to be with those in your household, and just to kind of get in close and just to, whether it's around a phone screen or a TV, just to praise, just to sing together, to learn the words of maybe a new song. And we know all of us that these are unprecedented times and there's nothing that you can kind of go back to in your mind and relate to and draw from past experiences, but we are comforted and at peace to know that we serve a wonderful God. He is marvelous and everything that we need in this time, if we just draw in close. And so we pray for the nation. We pray for you, our church family. We pray for the lost. We pray for the quarantined. We pray for the sick. And we just encourage you to never stop praying for all of those people, no matter the group, no matter where they are, no matter their circumstances, because we serve a wonderful and truly marvelous God. And so for this next song, if you just need to sit and be in prayer, if you wanna belt it out, if you wanna sing as a group, whatever you need in this time, it's our prayer that you would take this time and this opportunity to do so.
Well, good morning. Great to see all of you online. Although you're seeing me, I'm not seeing you. But um, so week two of having to deal with this coronavirus and hope all of you are being wise and being safe and staying at home as much as you can. Um, so we are this morning going to continue our series on the, the signs in the Gospel of John. I thank our worship team for leading us and wow, some great songs. Great is thy faithfulness. It's, you know, as, as believers, you know, we're, we just approach this whole pandemic differently. You know, we, we, we approach this pandemic in faith, without fear, trusting in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that he is sovereign, that he is on his throne, he is in charge, he is in control. And as we uh, mentioned last week, we don't lose. And so we have nothing to fear. I just want to encourage you to, you know, just stay focused on Jesus. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a challenge for us now to strive for that fellowship and stay connected with each other. And I'm just so thankful for technology uh, like, like we're being able to do this morning uh, to be able to, at least at some level, stay connected with one another. But we're always connected spiritually in the bond of Christ. So, so that's, that's awesome. So anyway, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 6 this morning. And, you know, kind of our plans this year have been to really focus on deepening all of our walk with Jesus. And there's nothing that's more powerful to help us strengthen our relationship with Christ than some kind of tragedy, some kind of tough situation that reminds us of our mortality, that reminds us of God's sovereignty, and moves us to increase our faith, reliance, and dependence upon Him. So, so in a way, you know, Jesus tells us, Paul tells us, to be thankful in every circumstance. So that, for that, I am thankful. I'm thankful that this pandemic, as terrible as it is, has, you know, kind of grabbed the body of Christ, not just nationally, but internationally, to really move us to focus on Him, to trust in Him more as we uh, just take things one day at a time. So, uh, same time, we want to continue to be in prayer, crying out to Him on behalf of our, our city, our nation, our world, humanity, the loss for believers to be bold in our faith, to be innovative in how we carry the faith forward. So, anyway, we've been focused this year on leaning into Jesus and... Um, so we're going through the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John is all about who is Jesus. And John's answer throughout this whole book of the Gospel of John is Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And so even in John chapter 20, he reminds us that he has written these things so that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. So that brings us today to our third part in this series, looking at the seven signs. So we, we're going to read this today, John chapter 6. Uh, it's a very familiar historical account of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And uh, we're going to look at that, break this down, and I think there's some great applications for us and where we are in our relationship with Christ individually. And now with, with this pandemic going on, I think it's very, very appropriate. So we're going to be in John chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 14. So I hope you have that open at home with your, with your family or your kids, or maybe a couple of you got together, whatever, um, as long as, you know, we're 10 or less, right? Uh, but anyway, so John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And uh, I, I guess you can stand at home in honor of reading of God's Word. That's kind of cool. Anyway, chapter 6, verse 1. Well, after this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. So that would be the signs we covered last week. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so these people can eat? And he asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Well, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And so Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Well, there was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men 
numbered about 5,000. And then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. And when the people saw this sign that he had done, they said, This really is the prophet who was to come into the world. And therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Well, let's pray together. Well, Father God, we love you. We are just so thankful that you are in control. And God, as we just uh, continue day by day, moment by moment through this pandemic, we're just constantly being reminded that we are not in control, but you are. And so God, I just pray for your believers, your people, your children, for all of us, you would increase our faith, increase our intentionality. God, increase the hope that we have in you and in you alone. And so, God, I just pray as we go through this text that you would just be glorified and honored, that you would accomplish your purpose in every one of our hearts. And God, if there's anyone listening who's not a follower of yours yet, who doesn't believe and have that trust yet, that God, through your word, that they would begin to have faith and trust and confidence in you. So, Lord, we just give this time to you. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, if you were standing at home, you can be seated. So, um... A big thought this morning as we uh, encourage you to pull out your notes and follow along. Uh, I think uh, there was a PDF attached. If you wanted to print that out, you could have. It's also on our Canaan STL app. Uh, so you can take the notes there digitally just as you normally do if you're here on Sunday mornings here with us in uh, the facilities. But here's the big thought today is that this fourth sign, right, points us to the fact that Jesus is God and that he is not bound by our limitations. So this is an incredible historical account of what Jesus does with just a very little to multiply it to feed the multitudes. Well, we see the more that we trust in him directly impacts what we'll see him do in us and through us. So you kind of see this, uh, this connection, right? Is the, the more that we focus in on ourselves and what we're able or not able to do, the less we're going to see God work. But the more we trust in God, the more we stay focused on him, the more that we, you know, really give him opportunity to do his thing, the more we're going to see him do his thing. The more we're going to see him do things and work in ways that really just blow our mind. I mean, can you imagine being... These 12 disciples, can you imagine being Andrew who goes and finds this little, this boy, and the word boy means he's probably like 10 to 11 years old, and, and he brings him with his lunch, probably, you know, the boys wonder why they're trying to, why are they trying to take my lunch, you know, but he try, try, takes his lunch, takes it to Jesus. Can you imagine Andrew as he watches Jesus taking his find and then using that little bit to feed so many people? Just go back just a few weeks before, before Andrew met Jesus or when Andrew first met Jesus. Do you think he ever imagined what God was going to do through him and with him? Powerful. God does the same things today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So just the same way God worked here in this, in this circumstance where God can take our little and make it a lot, he can do that today. So, looking at this text, um, we see that this Greek word here, we see it's used twice here in just this chapter, the word sign. It's kind of the, the hallmark word John uses as this pointer. And it's not just a miracle, it's a particular sign, it's a marker, it's a pointer, it's a designator. And so here we see that John's intentionally including this miraculous event as a pointer to show that Jesus is more than just a man. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. So let's just kind of unpack this and see how this fleshes out for our big thought today on how God is bigger than our limitations. So number one in your notes is the more focused we are on us and our own limitations, the less we'll see the glory of God in our lives. So let's look at this. The first thing here is we can easily say that I'm too tired. 
right? I, I'm too tired. So here the disciples had been, and they'd been ministering. Jesus had been ministering. They were tired. If you read the Matthew's account of this, um, there was just, they had been doing a lot of other things. They were trying to get away from the crowd to get a break. And the crowd just kept following them. And, and we're not talking just a few people, right? We see here it's 5,000 men. That's not counting women and children. So some scholars say there's as many as 15,000 people that are just following Jesus. And, you know, they're, they're not, they're not, it's, it's Passover. So it's kind of holiday. They're traveling. They're from out of town because Passover, the people would come from out of town to Jerusalem where the temple was because that was a key, key piece in the whole celebration of Passover was the sacrifices. So it was, a, it was a busy, busy time. Jesus in his flesh is worn out. The disciples are worn out. And as it says here, they're, they're, they're getting away. And it says a huge crowd was following him because of what they had seen. So Jesus could not escape the fame, the crowd, the paparazzi, if you will. <coughs> so they're tired. Have you ever just felt like you're just so tired? You, just, you got to get a break, but you can't. Because the demands of whether it's your position, your job, your family, just will not allow you to have a moment's rest. So what do you do? I know for me, I usually get kind of crabby. You know, I kind of just recluse myself and force myself to be separated from people. And, and you know, a lot of people, and I agree that I can be healthy to, to get your downtime. I mean, we need Sabbath rest, right? But here Jesus is just physically tired. So are the disciples. So we can say... Man, I'm just, I'm too tired to, to do this for the Lord. I'm too tired to serve these people. You know, but Jesus reminds us in Matthew 26, as he's about to be betrayed, he takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he says, stay awake and pray. Because the disciples are sleepy. It's late at night. It's the eve of his crucifixion. He says, so that you won't enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So many times we battle this. Our flesh just gets weak. Well, again, the disciples, are they focused on their limitations? There's so many things that happen here. Jesus asked them this question. Where will we buy bread so we can feed these people? And so Jesus knows what he's doing. He, he knows the answer. He knows what he's about to do. But he's testing them. He wants to hear what they say. He wants to hear their response to see where their faith, their frame of mind is. And like the disciples, we can easily say, I don't have enough blank, right? So look at some of the things the disciples said here. Uh, Philip says, 200 denarii, so it's 200 days wages, is not enough to, to buy enough bread. So we don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We can't do this. It's what Philip and the others are saying. And even Andrew. Andrew goes out and he finds this boy that has a lunchbox with him and brings him to Jesus. And he, he finds something. But he even says, but what is this little bit to so many? I don't have enough. Again, their whole focus is on themselves and their limited resources. When the whole time they have the limitless supplier standing right there in Jesus. That's, that is so like us, isn't it? So many times we get so blinded by our own limitations, our own inabilities. Man, we can't do that as a church. We don't have enough resources. We're never going to find the right leader to lead this ministry. We can never do this as a family. I'm not talented enough to, to teach a class. I'm not talented enough to do this or that. You know, you fill in your blank. What is your blank right here? Obviously, you see, there's, I'm not filling that blank in for you, right? It is your blank. What is the limitation that you focus on in your own life so much so that you don't see God do what God can do in you and through you? What is that limitation? Is it talent? Is it money? Is it experience? Is it knowledge? I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough wisdom. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough talent, resources. We've got to stop focusing on our inabilities and focus on God's limitless ability. Paul uses a, a specific church in 2 Corinthians 
church in Macedonia as an example of a group of believers who did not focus on their limitations, but focused on their love for Christ and his gospel. He says about this church, during a severe testing by affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty, so that shows their limitations, but it overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. And he goes on and says, they even gave beyond what they were able because this poor, impoverished church in Macedonia so wanted to be a part of what God was doing through the ministry of the Apostle Paul that they gave beyond their ability and God richly blessed, richly provided. And Paul uses them as the example of what it looks like to trust in God beyond our own limitations. So Andrew brings this boy with the fish. He found, he, that was his best. Andrew brings his best. He found all he could with this little boy's lunchbox, right? But it reminds us that even our best efforts seem completely inadequate. That's so true, isn't it? That is so true. I mean, I, as a pastor, I talk to other pastors, every pastor I talk to, always has this same perspective that we just feel so inadequate to do what God's called us to do. You know, so if you're out there thinking, well, I could never serve God in this capacity because I'm just, I'm just not, you know, I don't have enough knowledge. I don't know the Bible enough or I'm not talented enough. Wow, you're, you're, we're all in the same boat. Especially uh, right now with all these unchartered territories that we're in of navigating as a church family or as, you know, the group of churches. I've been on so many Zoom conference calls and panel discussions this past week talking with, you know, with other pastors and churches. How do we navigate, you know, not being able to gather for what looks like at least several weeks? How do we navigate that as a church? That's some tough questions, right? So cover your prayers on that. It feels completely inadequate. I've read more about the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic to see what churches did then. And I, I hardly even remember studying the 1918 flu epidemic. But I've read so much about it this week just to try to see what did churches do then. And you know what churches did then? They did exactly what we're doing now. In fact, they didn't have Zoom and they didn't have online um, you know, live stream and recorded messages and Facebook. They were just isolated. The government actually forced them not to meet. Pastors, some pastors that, you know, didn't listen to the wisdom of the day, they still tried to meet and were put in jail for it. So it's just tough waters to navigate. So very thankful that we have each other, that we have other church families going through exactly what we're going through. But most of all, I'm thankful we have the Lord Jesus who does know this is not uncharted territory for him. It is for us, but not for him. So we've got to stay focused on him but because our best so often seems inadequate. Even in Isaiah talks about this in chapter 64. It says, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. This is why we need Jesus. Whether it's for salvation, to get everlasting life and forgiveness, because we can never earn that on our own. Even our most righteous deeds that we do are just so still filthy in the eyes of God because he is so holy. So we still need Jesus if it's for salvation or even if it's for, you know, just living day-to-day -day life, making decisions for our family, for our church, for ourselves. We are desperate for Jesus. So we see that the first point, the more focused we are on us and our limitations, the less we'll see the glory of God in us and through us. So as we say a lot of times, it's just, it's not about me. It's not about us. So turn whoever you're watching this with and just say, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's all about him. Because number two in your notes is the more focused we are on him and his limitlessness, the more we'll see the glory of God in our lives. Because first, Jesus is not limited by knowledge. So here's the disciples <clears throat> scrambling trying to figure out what are they going to do to get this food? What are they going to do to, to honor the Lord's command to feed them? They have no idea. They don't have knowledge on how they're going to achieve such an outcome. Just like right now, we have no knowledge on how long this is going to last. How steeply is this 
curve going to climb? Or how flat are we going to be able to keep it because of things like social distancing? We don't know. We don't have the knowledge of tomorrow. We don't have the knowledge of what's going to be, what is it going to be like in April or May or June. We don't know. For a lot of us, the lack of knowledge can be a very scary thing. But again, we're to trust in God and let him, that perfect love, cast out all fear. Jesus does not share that limitation. He has full knowledge. It even says right here, if you go to verse 6, after Jesus asked him, where will we buy this bread? He says, he asked this to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. This didn't shock Jesus that these hungry people were following him. It didn't shock him that Andrew only found a few fish and a few loaves. None of that surprised Jesus. He was not moved off his course one millimeter. He still knew exactly what he was doing. He still knew exactly what he was going to do. In fact, he just leveraged this moment as an opportunity to show off his glory and to do great things in and through the disciples. And do you think that later on, years and years later, when Andrew, as according to history, when he was captured and he was sentenced to be executed by crucifixion, and they're asking him, telling him, if you will just recant your faith and your claim that this Jesus of Nazareth is king, if you will just recant that, we will spare you. What's going through Andrew's mind? You know, what's, what's he thinking about as he's faced with death? Why should I say yes? I'm sure out of the many memories that flooded Andrew's mind, that the Spirit of God was just put in his mind to encourage him, to motivate him. I'm sure one was this memory of bringing a basket of just a few fish and a few loaves to Jesus and just watching the Master at work. And I'm sure that fueled him in those last few moments to say, how can I deny such an incredible Savior as Jesus I've seen him do these things. There is no way I'm recanting. You go ahead and you do your worst. And they did. They executed Andrew on an X-shaped cross. But he died, not for what he merely believed, but for what he knew he saw. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, feed the multitude from just a few baskets. Jesus, the Messiah, raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus the Messiah himself raising after his own crucifixion, death, and burial. Jesus saved Andrew. And Andrew was able to see God do these great things because he learned how to trust in the limitlessness of God. That's why Paul writes this in Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches, both in the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God knows all things. So he is not jostled. He is not caught off guard. He is not surprised and shocked when the tragedies, the pandemics, the, the, the disasters of life happen. Not only is he still on his throne, but his plan to do good even incorporates the bad. We quote Romans 8, 28 a lot here. It says, we know that God works all things. Just turn to whoever you're watching this and say, all things. All things together for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. It's a great promise that even in this pandemic, even in the, you know, the uncertainty of jobs and the uncertainty of stock markets, the uncertainty of when are kids ever going to go back to school, the uncertainty of all these things, <clears throat> we have the promise of God that he is working this for the good of those who love him. And that good is to make us more like Christ. What a great opportunity. And we also see that Jesus is not limited by our insufficiencies. That's great news. That is great news for every one of us. That God is not limited by what we can't do. You know, he, he's not limited at all, right? So our insufficiencies 
God will never use an excuse as well. I couldn't bless you because you're just not good enough. I couldn't bless you because you're not talented enough. I couldn't bless you because you're not smart enough. Those concepts, those words never come out of God's mouth. Not a single time. Andrew brought his insufficiency to Jesus. And Jesus took it and ran with it. Jesus didn't cast him out. Jesus didn't say, Andrew, are you an idiot? <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't say that Andrew was foolish for bringing his insufficiency to him. No, Jesus took what Andrew brought and made it happen. We just need to trust him and bring him our meager insufficiencies and let God do with our insufficiencies what no one else can, and that is make this sufficient. We see in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul's battling this. Paul's struggling with this thorn in his side is what he calls it. We don't know exactly what that is, but he's prayed to God to remove it, to remove his insufficiency. And here's what Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Just, just say that out loud. Just, let, just speak that out right now. Ready? My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus is enough. Right now in our pandemic, Jesus is enough. What if we don't have enough tests? What if they don't figure out a vaccine? Jesus is enough. I was on a panel yesterday with Chad um, Hodges, our director of missions for the Jefferson Baptist Association, and Jason Walters um, was on that panel too. And Jason <clears throat> reminded us of a quote that we've heard, but it's just so powerful. He said, there on the panel, he said, Jesus, we, we, we fail to remember that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. This is so true, so true. When we come to the realization that utterly we are totally dependent on Jesus, and he's truly all we have. That's when we truly recognize the depth of this truth that he's really all we need. His grace is enough. When Andrew came to Jesus, it wasn't that Andrew's, this little boy's fish and loaves was enough. It wasn't. It was, I mean, mathematically, physically, naturally, completely inadequate to feed 15,000 people. But Jesus was all he needed. Jesus was enough. Because that weakness of that insufficient gift to the Lord of those loaves and fish was the opportunity that Jesus said, my power is made perfect, made complete. It's demonstrated in those weaknesses. And we see that. Let us see. We see that Jesus is not limited by physics and by nature, nor should he be. This is a very rational thought because he is the creator. And is it not rational to understand that the one who created everything into existence out of nothing could take a few fish and loaves and, create, and recreate those into multiples? Absolutely. That is logical. Anyone who can take nothing and say, let there be this, and boom, there's the cosmos, can take just a little fish and loaves and multiply those into more fish and loaves. That is logical. That is rational. Again, and the sign here, the pointer that John is, taught, is, is referencing, this demonstrates that he's not just a man, that he is God. He's the Son of God, and he is God's Messiah to us. So he is not limited by physics and nature, because he defied them all right here. And letter D, he also is not limited by our lack of understanding. So after this happened, the people are amazed. I mean, they're, they're satisfied. This is, look at the result of letting God do what only God can do. There is satisfaction. There is contentment, right? The people eat and are full. They are, there's leftovers. I know in my household, we love leftovers. We don't have them that much because there's nine mouths going at it, right? But we have leftovers. We love leftovers. It's satisfying. It says they love this, right? It says, verse 12, when they were full, he told them to collect it. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets. And there's all these words of filled and overflowed, abundance, satisfaction. Seeing Jesus do what only Jesus can do is the most satisfying reality that we get to live in. It's more satisfying than just a good meal. 
It's even more satisfying than a great marriage. A great marriage is so satisfying. Seeing her kids excel is so satisfying. But nothing compares to the satisfaction we have in Christ alone. But here, Jesus, his success was not dependent upon the people's ability to understand what happened. Because look at what their response was after being so satisfied. It says in 16, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this really is the prophet who was to come into the world. So here, that it had kind of stressed them to the top of their own ability of understanding, right? In their day and age, they, they did not have a category for Jesus to be God the Son. That, that was not a category that their mind had been open to yet. So they took their ability of understanding to the maximum, which said this is the prophet that was to come. Probably thinking about the, the prophecy in Malachi that Elijah would return the prophet to prepare the way of the Messiah. Maybe they're thinking that, not sure. But they were just saying, look, this is, this is the greatest guy our mind can get to, the prophet. Their understanding was limited. It was short. It was inaccurate. Yes, Jesus is a prophet, but he's so much more than a prophet, right? But this is where they could get to. But that did not limit Jesus from doing what he's able to do. And so his glory is not limited by our lack of understanding. God is almighty and all-powerful, completely separate from us. God is not dependent upon us in any way. God doesn't need us. We are privileged that he chooses to love us. We are privileged that he includes us in what he's doing. But he is not desperate for us. We are desperate for him. And we're reminded of this by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, <coughs> verse 20. It says, Now him who is able to do above and beyond all, I love that word all, all that we ask or think. And I've used the word imagine here, which I love that. That God is able to do above and beyond all that we can imagine. According to the power that works where? In you and in me. So this power, this, this limitless power of God that is able to do anything, that overcomes our insufficiencies, that overcomes our hesitations, that overcomes our lack of understanding, that power is in us. And he goes on and he says, To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Folks, we serve the most incredible being imaginable. He is going to receive glory even through this awful pandemic. He's going to receive glory even if you lose your jobs. He's going to receive glory even if we contract coronavirus. He is going to receive glory even if we can't meet for more weeks than we're anticipating. He's going to receive glory because that's just what he does. And that's who he is. And he is going to do great things in this time. And if we, as his people, will get our focus off of ourselves, off of our limitations, off of our inabilities, and focus our trust on him and his limitless abilities, we're much more open to see the great things that God will do. <clears throat> As I read about this 1918 influenza epidemic, I read a lot of notes and articles written by pastors during that time and just immediately following that time. And what happens? A revival broke out. The 1920s saw the powerful preaching of people like Billy Sunday where people were awakened to their need for Christ. They were awakened to their inabilities. And there became to be this, this hunger, this yearning for hope, this desire to, to really believe in an all-powerful, almighty God who's got this in his hands. And we saw historically church houses being filled 
for normal services, for revival services. And we saw many people get saved in the early 1920s, just on the backside of the flu epidemic of 1918. What we saw was the church being the hands and feet of Jesus during the epidemic, where a lot of people were just simply reclusing themselves. The church was being wise, but also they didn't stop serving people in need. We saw a lot of churches, when there was such a shortage of hospitals, many churches opened up their, their worship centers, got the pews out, and, and made it a makeshift hospital to serve the sick, giving, giving doctors and nurses much more room to operate and to do their thing. We saw the church be a light to their communities. And the result? Revival. And here we are, on the, hopefully in the middle, but probably more in the beginning of this, what are we going to do as Canaan? What are we going to do as God's people here in St. Louis? How we respond speaks volumes of what we believe. If we panic, if we're full of fear, that shows that we don't believe in a big God. That we're focused on us. We're focused on our limitations and our inabilities. But if we stay focused on God, we respond with love, with compassion, with connection, with serving and ministering and just being a beacon of hope. And that on the back side of this, we pray for revival. You know, we've had to call Life Action Ministry. We were supposed to have revival services in April. We've had to postpone that. But God doesn't need that particular group of people to accomplish revival in us. He can do that right here, right now, in your homes, on this platform, wherever we are, he can do revival in us beginning right now as we decide, I'm going to trust Jesus completely. So trust him. Have you ever had that moment in your life when God said, you need to trust me. You're a sinner. I am holy, but I love you. I gave my son Jesus to die in your place. Trust in him as your Lord and Savior. And you'll know me, and I will be your father. I mean, what a great moment that is. That's what we call being saved, being born again. So if you've never had that moment in your life, I pray that even right here, right now, as you listen to this online, distantly, remotely, but that God speaks to your heart. And you just right now just cry out to say, Jesus, save me. I need you. I cannot do this by myself because I am a sinner and you are holy and good and perfect and righteous and I am full of sin I am insufficient inadequate and just cry out to Jesus to save you and you know what he will it's a great thing about the scriptures it's filled with this phrase he she or they cried out to God or cried out to Jesus and you know, there's not a single episode in the entirety of Scripture, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, there's not a single episode where God heard the cry of the people and he said, no. When he hears the cry of his people, he answers. When you cry out to the Lord for salvation, he answers. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It's all of us. So if you've never cried out to God, if you've never trusted in Jesus, do that right now and be saved. And then let us know about it. Send us an email. You know, send us a, a text message. Call us and say, I got saved. Post on Facebook. Hey, I got saved this morning. I gave my life to Jesus. I trusted in Jesus. I tell you what, there'll be virtual hooping and hollering going on in the Facebook world when that happens. But let us know. For those of you that are saved, and maybe you're tempted to despair or get, get extremely anxious about what, what tomorrow, next week, next month holds, just cry out to Jesus. He's the only one we have that is all sufficient to handle this. So cry out to Jesus. Let me pray for you.
Father, we love you. We're just so thankful for your goodness, your grace. God, thank you that you are almighty, all-powerful, all-sufficient. And God, I just pray that you would help us, that you would minister to us, that you would increase our faith, increase our trust, increase our focus to be absolutely laser fixed on you so that, God, the, the fears and the panics around us won't deter us, that, God, we'll be intentional and still serving our neighbors, serving one another, God, looking for opportunities to share your gospel, to be your light in a, in a world, in a city, in a nation right now that is desperately in need of hope. So God, use us, your people, for your glory. God, I pray if there's anyone listening, watching, it's not saved, that God, they just cried out to you. And if they haven't yet, I pray that they, that they just have such a, an old word, an unction from you, God, that they cry out to you right here, right now, to save me, Lord, rescue me. Because God, we need you. So Lord, we just want to you to be honored and glorified. And we're just so thankful you allow us to be a part of what you're doing, to be a part of your kingdom, God, to have a relationship with you, to be able to call you our Abba Father, our Daddy, because of faith, because of Jesus. So Lord, we just pray that in the minutes, the days, weeks to come, we honor you and our faith-filled responses to what's going on in the world we're in. And may you be honored. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, love every one of you. I know we so desperately miss, I desperately miss us gathering and just seeing your faces and shaking your hands, hugging your necks and patting you on the back and just seeing how life's going. Um, we're going to get some phone calls and, and be intentional and getting in touch with every one of you that we possibly can over the next few weeks and months. So, um, we're going to do everything we can to stay as virtually connected as possible. Um, but just, just some other things. Um, you know, now's the time we normally do our offering. So um, just remind you, uh, four ways to give right now. Uh, one is online. And, um, you know, there have been some issues with our website. So uh, that will be hopefully rectified soon, if not already. Um, but in person and mail, you can just, I know a lot of you, very thankful, a lot of you have just come by the, the office this past week to drop off your tithe checks. That is so important for us to continue functioning and ministering and being able to serve people as a church. I know there's going to be a, a lot of benevolence need coming up in the next few months. And so your offerings make it possible for us as the body of Christ to, to help and to be the hands and feet of Jesus to serve people who are desperate. Um, Canaan app, you can use the Canaan STL app. Uh, to give. And then also uh, a brand new option we've just launched this past week is, is text to give. And we'll be sending a, an email instruction out on how to use that, um, that option, which is a great option. So we just we want to encourage you to continue uh, to bless, to be a blessing uh, to others through giving. But we love you. God bless. A lot of good things coming up. I know Pastor Brian mentioned um, earlier. So um, we love you. Pray God's grace upon you. Be wise. Be careful. Be safe. But be bold. Don't be afraid. Because we have an unconquerable God. We we'll love you. God bless. <laughs>